So I'm going to try to be a little bit more gentle. Um, and I'm going to start with giving a little recap of um, what we did yesterday. And I'm just going to use like six or seven slides for that. Uh, first of all, let me remind you of the motivation for this. Uh, the motivation for this is very much like in the same line of what Sharon was talking about this morning. It's not just about deep learning. Uh, you also want to do reasoning. And uh, if you have knowledge, then you'd better use it. And uh, the effort in the SRL community and the probabilistic programming community is basically to combine the reasoning with the learning effort. Uh, today, I'm also going to touch upon like how you can combine the stuff I've seen yesterday with uh, neural networks. That's the neurosymbolic uh, learning part. Uh, I've also argued that there's like these two different uh, frameworks. One is called statistical relational AI or statistical relational learning, and the other probabilistic programming. And the problog that we've seen fit uh, both of these paradigms because it's a programming language, but it's also like a statistical relational representation. Now, what the SRL community and models have in place uh, have in common is basically that uh, they are based on first order logic and first order logic really allows you to reason about different entities, about the relationships amongst them and they also take into account um, background knowledge. They also allow you to make abstraction of the number of individuals that you have and uh, they allow you to reason at and model at a fairly general level. Uh, and maybe I should come back to the example that I touched upon only briefly yesterday, which is like this plate model. Uh, this is a typical uh, representation that are be is being used in graphical models. Uh, you see that the rectangles, uh, what they do is um, basically there is an S in there, and that says that for every student, that kind of template is repeated. Uh, in the other plate, there is like a C in there, and for every course that will be uh, repeated. And so um, if you look at a set of uh, students and classes that you could have, well, then you could just fill these out and the template, uh, after filling out the templates or the plate model and grounding out, uh, you would get this kind of propositional graphical model. And so the nice thing about these representations is um, that while it works for any number of students, any number of classes, and uh, certainly if uh, you would have like a thousand students and a uh, hundred classes, uh, then there would be like um, more than a hundred thousand uh, random variables. Uh, still in this plate model, there will only be an, a few parameters uh, to be taken into account. Basically for every plate, you will have the typical kind of parameters uh, as we've seen. And of course, I've also shown that you can map that uh, onto uh, problog. So SRL have in common with these uh, plate models uh, that it's all about building uh, such models um, comp to build complex models in a very compact manner by exploiting these features of uh, first order logic and of the kind of template models that you have. It's also the case that you could learn such models uh, just from data. Uh, like the data that you have here, where you've got information about different students, about different courses, about different grades that they obtain, and could even be some partial uh, information uh, that you have in there. Now, the interesting thing is also that you can learn it from one set of students, and then once you have the model, you can apply it to other sets of students, and you can really port it, uh, because it's very declarative. Um, and another point that is important in these probabilistic uh, models, these expressive relational models, is that um, in many cases, if you end up with loads of, of, of people or loads of students, um, then it doesn't really matter a lot to distinguish them all. And uh, there's a kind of notion of exchangeability. I mean, the dependencies that you will get, and I'll show a little bit more towards the end of uh, today's lecture, uh, it's basically, it depends on the number of people you have. Um, say um, y you are in contact with people that have an infectious disease. I mean, the particular person will probably not matter a lot, but the number of contacts will matter. And um, it's that that uh, these SRL models are trying to take into account by really reasoning at, at the more general uh, level. I've also shown that with Problog, uh, you can even do more. 
uh, and with these probabilistic programming language and SRL models as well. Uh, what you can also do is you can kind of incorporate uh, things that you cannot express in these, these uh, plate models. Uh, one typical example is like the use of recursion. I mean, we've seen the smokers example yesterday. Uh, smokes depend on, well, you smoke or you're more likely to smoke if you have a friend that also smokes. And so that's kind of a recursive um, template uh, that you could not model uh, with this kind of representation. And then using the uh, declarative logics, what you can also do is you can like insert knowledge that you might have about these domains. Maybe uh, the rules of uh, when you succeed and when you fail uh, for your uh, courses or your curriculum, you can just encode that in logic and typically that kind of rules and knowledge is readily available, so you'd better use it in a sense. All kind of ontological knowledge can be put into um, these systems in a very, very, very natural uh, manner. And that is in a sense um, why we are uh, using uh, these and, and why we are uh, kind of advocating these. Um, and that's about the SRL frameworks. The probabilistic programming is just like a little bit of a different angle on the same problem. It's more instead of a logic and a database perspective, it's more a programming language perspective. And uh, there the idea is that you use programming languages, um, I mean the kind of Turing equivalent, um, and uh, that you inject um, this randomness and also the inference me mechanisms and learning mechanisms uh, into these programming languages, yes? I think w what you specify is something that is typical. I mean, it's like a lot of parameter tying that's going on. You make abstraction of the individuals, and that gives you tools to specify the joint and that is much more easily, right? Is any other questions about this? Okay. Um, and so, so that's done two different angles, this probabilistic programming or this uh, logical-based languages. Um, Problog fits both of these uh, and is in a sense in, in the intersection. Um, and most of, of the, most of the languages that are used, like the Markov logic that I'll talk about later on, uh, that's clearly not a programming language. It's just like uh, a method to, to represent uh, probabilistic information. Um, I mean, this, these were the directed models. Markov logic is more a kind of undirected model, uh, graphical model, uh, if you like. And then things like church and many of the other languages that people have been talking about, like Anglican and Stan, uh, they're not really like SRL models uh, because they're not using logic. They're using something else like functional programming or imperative programming to do uh, very much uh, the same kind of, of, of things. Um, so this is um, why we're doing things. Um, the next thing is like, what are the key challenges? Uh, the key challenge is like inference. I mean, given that you have compact representations for models that can be extremely large, uh, the question is how to do inference and how to do learning effectively uh, in such models. And um, the, um, the, the steps that I've gone through yesterday is first of all that, um, and that's also what I've I shown here, is what the typical way of, of, of proceeding with inference is, is that you first ground out uh, only that part of your model that is kind of relevant. And so rather than uh, generating this huge graphical model, you try to focus in on that part that will be relevant to the kind of questions that you ask. And given that you work with the logic, you get a kind of logical theory back. You can get that back in the form of a proof, or it can also be in the form of a model or a possible world. Uh, and these were like two different angles uh, at the same, at the same uh, problem. Uh, I've shown these proof theoretic uh, approaches and I've also like shown these, these model theoretic ones. Uh, in both cases, what you do end up with is a weighted model counting problem. And that is why I've devoted so much attention to this weighted model counting. It's also clear if you think a little bit about it, I mean, plate models are kind of a simple SRL model uh, that are not too expressive. And um, well, SRL models you can solve by weighted model counting. And so that also means that plate models and 
their special case, which are just the Bayesian networks, the kind of graphical models you're used to. Also, probabilistic inference in these networks is nothing else than weighted model counting, at least for the discrete case. Uh, I've also mentioned yesterday that uh, there is the uh, extension of this weighted model counting towards working with continuous distributions, and then you're talking about weighted model integration. That is a framework that has been devised in, uh, in 2015, and that people are actually um, per pursuing uh, today. Now, once you formulate it as a kind of weighted model counting problem, there are these two uh, different and closely related uh, approaches that you can follow uh, to do the weighted model counting. Uh, one of which is like, okay, you take the logical formula um, that underlies this weighted model counting problem and you compile that into a kind of usable form, a form on which you can do the probabilistic inference uh, effectively and in polynomial time. It's then the case that the compilation step itself is the expensive step. But the idea is that, or the hope is, that if you compile once, you can query the network a lot of time. So even that, even though that um, your Bayesian network that you start from um, may be uh, very large and may be very hard to compile, once you've compiled it, you can query it uh, in, in polynomial time, basically. And that is why uh, this uh, knowledge compilation techniques uh, are really state-of-the-art. Uh, they've won uh, some of the competitions, and the website there to look at is that of UCLA. Uh, Adnan Darwish has done seminal work and also his uh, collaborators there. Uh, I showed the OBDDs yesterday, uh, but people are using uh, more advanced uh, special cases and refinements of these, like uh, the DDNNFs and the SDDs that you might have uh, heard of. So that's like the one approach, that is the knowledge compilation. You start from the logic, you compile it into a circuit, a kind of uh, data structure that will allow you to do the efficient inference. The other approach is what I was showing with the DPLL algorithm, and where I was also talking about uh, the semi-rings, uh, basically the, 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 the standard uh, satisfiability uh, algorithm, which is uh, DPLL, uh, Davis, Putnam, Loveland, and Logland. Um, Lodgman, um, to find like a satisfying assignment to uh, a logical theory. By just making tiny little changes to that algorithm, you can actually equip it with techniques to do model counting. That's com count how many satisfying models there are. And you can also use it to do weighted model counting. Uh, and so that's kind of a pretty uh, neat and, and cool result that uh, these semi-rings allow you to do a lot of things. Uh, when I first heard about semi-rings, I was not terribly excited. And then we made like an extension of Problog that is also incorporating these semi-rings. And it turns out that this is now the thing that we're using a lot. Uh, you just change your semi-ring and you can do a lot of different uh, things. Um, um, and so that's also what I'm going to mention today without going into a lot of technical detail. Now, the downside of this form of inference is, of course, that you still have to ground. If you look at the way people do theorem improving and logical inference in first-order logic, then they will try to avoid the grounding to the maximal possible extent. I mean, they will only ground when there's no other solutions. They will try to, to talk about... Uh, uh, for all, and they will keep the variables, and uh, the mechanism there is like a resolution um, in, in, in clausal logic uh, that are people doing. And so the question, and that's a bit the holy grail of uh, SRL and probabilistic databases, is can we do something similar for these probabilistic logics? Remember that uh, in going from um, uh, the propositional logic, uh, or, or going from the logical reasoning to the uh, probabilistic one, we need instead of keep track of one proof, we need to keep track of all the proofs. In, instead of looking at one satisfying assignment, we need them all because we need to count how many there are. And so the question is, can we just do this way more cleverly? And uh, that is, uh, in a sense, the holy grail uh, that I'll also be introducing uh, today uh, towards the end with a couple of uh, concrete examples uh, due to my former student, uh, now assistant professor at uh, UCLA, Guy van den Broek. Uh, so that's basically the kind of key motivation uh, for all of, of, of this work. Um, don't know, are there any questions still about this? That was not a question? Okay. 
Good. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do for the rest is um, go quickly through the program that I had uh, in mind and focus in on the stuff that I think is the most relevant and is doable in the next hour or so. Um, I just wanted to finish up inference by saying that, um, of course, I've so far talked only about exact inference. Uh, given the complexity of uh, the inference uh, procedures, it makes a lot of sense that people look also at approximate inference. And of course, people have uh, approximate inference is what people use in the probabilistic programming language, uh, community and functional programming imperative. That's all they use. Um, and the interesting thing is that you can also do approximations at the logical level. Uh, basically, you can find necessary conditions and sufficient conditions, and on the basis of these, uh, instead of finding a full proof, uh, you can, in a sense, find bounds for the proof. Uh, and there's many other ways in which you can also approximate the logic, but I'm going to leave that um, out uh, for uh, the rest of, of today. I mean, it's, um, again, more of, of this. Um, about parameter learning, well, uh, graphical models, they have parameters. And SRL models or these probabilistic programming languages also have parameters. And so the question is, can we estimate these parameters uh, from data? Here you see a little example. Uh, it's an old example from the WebKB uh, data set uh, where there is like um, some rules that tell you um, how to classify pages. And it's like the word classes and the link classes that you're going to be using in that. And the question is, can I feed in data now and just estimate the parameters? Uh, there's not much special about parameter estimation in SRL. We basically resort to the key techniques that uh, exist in the uh, graphical model community. Uh, and the way to see that is, OK, first of all, if you have like this program where this would be the rules, the green, and the pink would be the facts, uh, then, of course, we've seen yesterday with the um, uh, coin example that you can actually generate possible worlds of that, right? And so if you generate a couple of complete possible worlds out of that, it's fairly easy to use just maximum likelihood to, in a sense, uh, compute uh, your um, uh, maximum likelihood uh, parameters. Basically, what you would have to do is you would have to go uh, through... Um, what you would have to do is you would have to go through all of your facts for which you want to estimate parameters, and then you would check in how many of these uh, uh, possible walls and how many of these uh, uh, instances uh, of your data they occur, and then you just look at the relative frequency in which, uh, with which they are true, and you're done, basically. This is what uh, people... Uh, what's the easy case? Uh, but of course, um, yeah, generating this full possible worlds. I mean, if you talk about uh, 100,000 students, um, well, that's not what you really uh, want to do. So in practice, uh, you get like this partial interpretations, uh, which is like uh, very much in the same case as what you would have for the... Um, what you would have in, if you learn a probabilistic graphical model, uh, there would also be some things that you would not know, uh, some variables that you have not observed, and also for that case, uh, there are standard solutions that are being used, and the standard solution is typically to use uh, a kind of expectation uh, maximization um, for that um, so that is what people have done. And of course, then there is uh, some variations on that, and um, but that's basically what people do. Uh, the key points about parameter learning is, OK, you tie the parameters together. I mean, that's why these uh, graphical models, that is why this plate model that I showed is so compact. It's because it ties the parameters together. Um, and then, yeah, that's similar to other graphical models like HMMs. It's also similar to what happens in CNNs. And the key thing is to control uh, the groundings. Of course, if you can do the standard things of graphical models, you can also Bayesian parameter learning. And again, there, the whole Bayesian uh, methods, uh, they apply. And that is what people typically uh, use in the probabilistic programming community, the functional probabilistic and the, and the imperative probabilistic programming community. That's all they use. They will not use the EM there, basically. EM is more for the uh, logical and database-like um, approaches. Um, what I do want to talk a little bit about is how to learn 
uh, structure uh, because there is parameter learning and there is structure learning. Uh, structure learning means that you're going to learn some rules. Uh, one of the examples I briefly spoke about was like this knowledge-based construction, uh, showing some data from the never-ending language learning uh, uh, system uh, at uh, Carnegie Mellon. And in such databases, what people like William Cohen have done is they've actually derived uh, rules that from a snapshot of the data, which is very uh, imperfect because you only observe uh, some of the facts or you're only able to distill some of the facts, uh, to induce rules that will allow you to predict whether uh, or not certain relationship uh, will hold for um, uh, or can be derived from the facts that you already have. And they will do that on the basis of uh, what is called rule learning. And so uh, the task there is, given, uh, some, of these, given, given some of these facts, um, together maybe with their probabilities, can we in a sense learn uh, such rules? And that is quite standard uh, in the um, SRL community, that there are techniques for learning the structure uh, of such rules. Here it's in a sense prologue rules or prologue-like rules, uh, but things like that is, is what people uh, have done. And there's multiple ways of, of doing that. Uh, the differences are typically uh, in the details, uh, in the kind of heuristics that people search, uh, that people use for the search, also in the kind of quality criterion, um, and then also maybe the space that is being searched, uh, what kind of spaces of clauses or rules uh, are you searching? And then there is tricks to make it uh, efficiently. I'm not going to illustrate it on the probabilistic data. I'm just going to go back and look at purely logical data uh, because that's also a kind of technique that has been quite popular and is this kind of technique that um, is being adapted to learn these uh, SRL models. Uh, and I'm going to illustrate it on a pretty old example. It's one on uh, learning molecules, uh, where here you see uh, a couple of molecules from a data set, uh, two positive or two active, two inactive. And what you also get uh, is a kind of structural alert back, uh, something that you can interpret, something that provides an explanation. Uh, because the structural alert occurs in the two active ones, but it does not occur in the uh, inactive ones. And so one way of doing that is by uh, turning everything into logic. And um, you can encode your molecules uh, in, in using this kind of fact representations. You can also easily inject uh, background knowledge. Uh, for chemists, it will be important that there are like certain types of rings uh, that exist. Um, and so you can inject a lot of chemical knowledge, if you want, into these um, databases. And uh, here it's done again in logic. Uh, you could do things like that. And then the question is, can I come up with a set of rules that if the rules fire, my molecule will be active. Uh, if the rule doesn't, if none of the rules fires, it will be inactive in a sense. Um, and um, to give you just a flavor of how these things work, uh, what they do is uh, the standard algorithm, which is now uh, pretty old, is going back to like uh, the early 90s by uh, Ross Quinlan. And so um, what um, he is doing is he's, he's kind of doing a greedy separate and conquer search uh, to find different rules and then also a general specific uh, to specific search for single clauses. So initially you're going to say, well, it's always, there's no conditions, the molecule is always active, and then you go through a kind of search process, you're going to add, uh, you're going to see that, uh, first of all, this rule is overly general because there's also like some negative examples, some inactive molecules that are uh, being erroneously classified as positive. And so you're going to refine the rule. And one way of doing that is uh, by looking for a rule that will um, exclude uh, some of these negatives, and it will still cover only some of the positives, basically. And so what you would do there is like you would uh, search a space, and this is like a hill climbing or a beam search um, that people would be using. And so you would consider all kind of initial conditions. Uh, what if uh, I, I add a nitrogen or a carbon uh, as a kind of condition uh, on the molecule to be um, active or not? You would then score these in one way or another, and you would kind of repeat um, your process. You would go deeper 
um, because this rule would still, I mean, all of the rules in there would still be covering um, negative examples. That means they would classify some of the negatives as positive, and that would be uh, overly general. So you would refine it, and uh, you would go to the next level, and you would uh, search until, well, you would find a rule, uh, maybe this rule that uh, is not uh, covering any of the negatives and still accounting for uh, many of the positives. You would add that rule to your database and you would basically repeat because maybe the rule does not explain all the positive examples and you need uh, to continue. And so you would uh, do another search um, which would be very similar that would result in another rule that you could add and you would repeat this process until all of the rules would... Uh, uh, classify and um, all your molecules uh, in more or less uh, the same uh, category. Now, this kind of search, um, this comes back from the original uh, rule-based uh, learning, the kind of classification that people are doing. Now, that search has been adapted for use in the SRL systems. And uh, the key thing there is that um, people are using different heuristics, but the way of searching, like typically one rule after the other, uh, is taken uh, over. It's just that the scoring mechanisms, the loss functions, uh, that they are, are kind of different. If people are interested um, in this, uh, I would suggest to have a look at my old book on uh, logical and relational learning, which is focusing on this kind of, of technology. Um, okay, so that was um, concluding the part about learning. Let's look a little bit uh, at uh, dynamics. And dynamics is where reasoning is really, really helpful. Uh, what do I mean with dynamics? Uh, I mentioned this multi multiplayer online uh, game yesterday. Uh, in such games, uh, the world is dynamic. At every point in time, there is like a kind of graph structure, which you can represent as a relational database. And um, that uh, relational database will change over time, basically. Uh, at every point in time, there will be entities that come in, maybe entities that disappear, and also relationships that will hold or will no longer hold. And um, the question is here, can I build a model uh, for such uh, dynamic systems that will predict um, like what's going to happen in the future. And typically, it's also helpful to have probabilistic predictions because the further you go in the future, uh, the less likely or the less certain uh, your predictions uh, will become. And so um, you can easily do that with the kind of logics or extensions of, of these logics that I have uh, talked about. Uh, here you see like one rule, and uh, the key thing is that um, you now go from one point in time to a next point in time. So there is like uh, the dynamics which is captured like as a transition probability in a Markov model. Uh, we now have transition rules uh, that go from time t to time t plus one. And so what this rule is saying is um, if there is um, a city that is owned... Um, by an owner and there is another city that's owned by an attacker and the two cities are close to one another, then at the next time point, it may be that uh, the attacker has uh, conquered uh, the city basically. And that could happen with probability 40% and with probability 60% nothing uh, could happen. It's just an example to illustrate the kind of rules that you have. You go from the condition parts is about now, the conclusion part is about what will happen uh, in the future. Uh, and then you can actually uh, learn uh, rules uh, to kind of get reasonable predictions uh, a couple of steps ahead. Of course, we did not do that on the multi-million uh, player uh, data sets, but we had data sets with like 600 cities and, and so reasonable data sets where you could uh, show to do something. There's also kind of an extension that is uh, interesting. Uh, if you look at reasoning in, in real worlds, um, and we've been doing some simple experiments in, in robotics, uh, really focusing on, on the reasoning. Um, here, uh, what I'm going to show you in a little movie, I know it's a bit old-fashioned to show these boxes with this art tags, but we can do it um, without the art tags uh, if we want. It's just a matter of, of making it, it, it work and, and implement in a sense. But uh, what you will see is that um, uh, it's kind of 
typically pretty hard to track uh, when objects are invisible. Um, and so what um, the relational particle filters that we've been using uh, with these very similar representations are doing is that they have like spatial relations uh, um, that, that are going in their states. Like for instance, that one box is inside the other and um, that is being used uh, to reason where all of the objects are, also those that are uh, occluded, those that you cannot really see. Uh, we've been extending that uh, also together with people in Sweden, um, Alessandro Safiotti's team, uh, to really do also manipulation uh, in, in richer contexts, also like if you grab apples and uh, there's other apples that you can still know uh, where all the apples uh, are basically in the place. I'm going to show you this little movie. Uh, here is Davide and you see there are initially two, two blocks uh, and there you see where the particles are. Um, and so you see that uh, the system does know that uh, one box is inside the other. Uh, so now it falls out of the small box. And so you see that the particles are, are different again. You put it in. Uh, there's a third object coming in and you can really uh, juggle around. And um, there's some reasoning behind it that uh, keeps track of, of where the objects are at all points in time. Uh, here is another uh, scenario that I can explain a bit better because here I can show you also the rule. It's a magnetic scenario. It's something we also did with kids, uh, having um, them showing like uh, multiple objects and the objects can be magnetic, they can be ferromagnetic or they can be non-magnetic. And so it is well known that non-magnetic objects, if, you, if they touch, nothing happens. Uh, also, if a magnetic and um, uh, ferromagnetic uh, object uh, are close, well, they will attract one another. And if you take two magnetic objects and you put them uh, next to one another, you'll either get repulsion or attraction, basically. And so um, here is a, a, a kind of pretty similar movie um, where you see that uh, we've used one of these Maybe I should replay it. Yeah, so where you see again, there is like three of these objects. And initially, you don't know uh, which is which. Uh, the distribution of the three um, objects being magnetic, ferromagnetic, or non-magnetic is like uh, not known. And you'll see that by, uh, well, the touch, by the actions of, of the people, that you get certain information. And we do, we've done that with kids. And it really requires some kind of reasoning to know after a few uh, touches, um, well, what, what is what in a sense. And uh, so you'll see that uh, the thing will evolve. And um, maybe I should. Okay, let's try that again. Okay, so nothing happens here in the first. And so you see that the probability for these two is changing. Then there is attraction. And again, uh, they are changing. And now the interesting thing comes. It's still like uncertain which is which. Um, and you'll see that the final interaction is basically uh, conclusive. It allows you basically to uh, infer what kind of, of setting you have. It's, one of, it's a simple example that shows that uh, reasoning uh, is, is kind of helpful also in this uh, kind of, of settings. And it's also an example where you've got mixed probabilistic and logical reasoning. It's, it's a toy example. I realize that. Uh, I'll show you some uh, more realistic examples later. Uh, you can look at the rules for this. Uh, these rules could be learned. Uh, in this case, they were uh, handwritten, uh, but I'll show you some, some other ones where you actually have learned them. Uh, the first rule says, okay, uh, initially I don't know uh, what type of object each of each is. Then the second rule gives you some indication of what happens if, uh, depending on the types of the object, so if you have two magnets, uh, they will either attract or repulse. Uh, and then you also get something uh, about what the next possible position will be. And this is like uh, using this def um, distributional clauses. Um, 
which are not just limited to discrete random variables, but which are able to deal with uh, continuous uh, distributions, and you can really reason over that. So you can reason about the x, y coordinates uh, with this kind of, of setting. Uh, and then there is like uh, a particle filter that is uh, based on that, and uh, that's in a sense very much in line with uh, a kind of sampling approach, um, uh, kind of particle filter, uh, just that is relational and that there are some, some extras for this. Um, we've also um, applied such things in a robotic setting, and here it's really where you want to... Um, where, where you really want to, to get some kind of reasoning. Uh, maybe uh, there is like uh, shelves with different objects on these shelves, and maybe the task for the robot is to reach a particular kind of configuration. And um, what we've done uh, in this case is um, an initial phase uh, where you just focus and play around with two or three objects, uh, you gather data. It's kind of a babbling phase. So you gather data, and from these data points, uh, what you then do is you induce rules. Um, once you've induced these roles, there is a planning component that will allow you to do the reasoning to do uh, this kind of, of movement. Um, and so um, this is, um, well, it's what you see is the simulation with the ICOP, but we've also used the real ICOP. This was in collaboration with the uh, University of Lisbon, uh, Jose Santos, Victor's uh, group, uh, where we've run uh, these experiments. Um, and it's kind of interesting to relate this also to uh, some of the things that you've seen earlier. I mean, when you uh, listen to Ben Rossman's uh, talk on Friday, uh, he was talking about uh, some of these uh, relational games uh, where the task is to move around uh, objects and uh, certain, well, there were certain deadlocks that you could reach. And uh, there were also uh, certain rules of the game that maybe initially uh, you didn't want to, you, you didn't know. And um, he argued that neural networks uh, still have difficulties with that and was also advocating uh, some kind of local rules uh, to be trained there. Now, it's very interesting to see the analogy between what he proposed and what we do. Uh, what we do here is like we get rid of the grids because it's like we work with the real um, x, y coordinates. And um, so it's, it's in the real uh, space in a sense. Okay, this is toyish. What we have is still also uh, a little bit toyish. But um, the kind of uh, descriptions of the actions that we learn are basically that if in a certain configuration you execute an action, right? You execute an action, for instance, you tap with the force of 10 uh, from left to right, that um, uh, and the object have certain properties that there will be a dis a dis uh, displacement kind of delta going in different directions, and you learn probability distributions uh, over that. Uh, and so uh, this is essentially what you can learn. Uh, we've again done that um, in various settings. Uh, here you see uh, with with the smaller robot, the one that the only one that we own for now, where we've we've run these experiments, and in the first step we really have uh, learned uh, such rules. In the next step, uh, you can then uh, combine these with reasoning in order to to do some kind of planning uh, uh, as it should, um, and and yeah. Okay, maybe I'll skip these. Okay, let's look at um, the next part, which is about, um, well, integration of deep learning and um, neural networks. Uh, I think that's today a pretty hot topic uh, in the community. Uh, it's not only today. I mean, people have been looking at this uh, for many, many years. Uh, since the 90s, there were already attempts in the neurosymbolic uh, computation, um, the neurosymbolic computation uh, community uh, to do that. Uh, I think today it's more actual than, than ever before uh, because a lot of the data sets that uh, are out there uh, do require some kind of relational thinking and also do require some kind of reasoning. Uh, for instance, if you look at the visual genome, there is a lot of relations in the images. Uh, if you look at uh, the clever data set like uh, something like this, 
um, which generates images uh, like these, where there is like uh, a number of configured objects, and then you want to ask uh, basically logical questions about this, like are there an equal number of um, large things in metal spheres uh, in the uh, kind of image? And so I think therefore that this is a pretty uh, active, I think also it's a pretty important and emerging area of research. Um, and uh, there's uh, different angles at this. Um, you can divide most of the work that exists in three different um, lines of research. Uh, a first one is that people like Serafini and Diligenti, uh, what they have been doing is they've typically been using constraints and templates and um, in logic, uh, like logical constraints on what combinations are allowed and which combinations are not allowed. And then they've used that with data. And in a sense, if the constraints are not satisfied, then you get like some kind of penalty in your loss function. But the idea is that uh, I think in all of these works, uh, the logic is kind of getting compiled into the network. And so once you've learned, uh, there is no logic left. You just have a neural network that can answer the questions. Um, and I'm not sure this is the best possible uh, way of working. Uh, another thing that people have been looking at is, um, which is more in the line of knowledge-based model construction, um, knowledge-based model construction is that you use, in a sense, the logic to generate uh, a kind of model. Uh, we'll see later, uh, if there's time left, that Markov logic is doing this kind of, of knowledge-based model construction. You use the logic as a template uh, to generate a kind of, 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 of model. I mean, the plate model that we saw is also very much in the spirit, right? You, you get a template, and the template is, in a sense, in logic. You feed in all your objects and instances, your students, your classes, and you end up with uh, a kind of, of large, um, large, large model. Um, now, um, what they do is they use a kind of logic templates to generate particular types of neural networks, which are then trained. Uh, and again, afterwards, you, in a sense, lose the logic. The logic is just used initially to, to do uh, this kind of generation. And then the last uh, kind of style of, of work that um, um, is, is more connected to like programming uh, frameworks. Uh, and uh, here you have like also the differentiable neural computer uh, and also like differentiable programming languages or interpreters. The ones that we have been uh, inspired on is this differentiable force interpreter. Um, that um, people are using. And the idea there is that you get a kind of programming framework and you try to learn programs for that. Um, this is uh, essentially what you, you have uh, there. Um, we recently developed an integration of Problog and Deep Learning, and in Prince. And, and that was actually amazingly easy. I shall argue or show why that was easy. Um, and um, what this is doing is basically injecting neural networks uh, by extending the logic a little bit. Um, and, and the key idea is, is very similar to what we did to extend the logic with uh, probabilistic models. I mean, we again looked at what is kind of the simplest non-trivial primitive that you could add to the language. And um, that's actually adding a neural predicate in a sense. Uh, and I'm going to show what that neural predicate is. And you just add these neural predicates to Problog, and then you can do, uh, you, you can get the kind of integration uh, that you want. And I should stress, this is still very, very early days. Uh, and I guess that holds for many of the uh, existing works. There's no like, um, well, impressive applications of this yet, but the hope is that this will lead to uh, something uh, in the future. Um, so uh, as compared to most of the work that I've uh, talked about earlier, uh, you retain the full expressivity of the original probabilistic programming language. I mean, you just added a new construct to the language, so you don't compile it away. You also get um, that the logic, which is in many approaches simply pushed uh, into the neural network and then it disappears. There's no more logical reasoning that can give you like explanations or whatever. Uh, you still get it. I mean, you get the neural part and you get the logical part. 
um, in some of the systems, like um, I think the one from Serafini and, and some other ones, uh, they are used on, they're based on a kind of fuzzy logic, uh, whereas we have a probabilistic logic. Um, and then the other thing is that uh, we've got a still a very clear semantics. We know exactly what our probabilistic programming language uh, equipped with these neural predicates uh, is, is referring to. Um, and so what's the, the idea? As I said, the idea is to just uh, map neural networks uh, onto what I call a neural predicate. Uh, I mean, if you look at, um, and that's again the simplest standard uh, non-trivial example uh, from uh, images and computer vision, um, where you get um, images uh, of MNIST uh, neural network would typically produce uh, some kind of uh, classification uh, of this type. Uh, and if you normalize that, you can interpret uh, the output distribution as a kind of probability. And so this is what uh, our uh, neural predicates are doing. You feed something like an image in, and you will uh, encode it as a, pro as, as a kind of uh, mapping to give you a particular probability distribution. So whenever you encounter a neural predicate uh, like um, um, which has an image like that, you would map it uh, onto um, the corresponding distribution, and then you can reason whether with the probabilities of being seven and one, you can take that uh, into to account. Um, and so these neural predicates behave very much in the same way as what we had for the uh, probabilistic facts, basically. The probabilistic facts are just facts where you add a probability to it. Uh, here, uh, the other thing that we've seen there is like with the, um, the ball example, you could have like three, three different uh, alternatives. So if you draw a ball from the first urn, uh, you got like red, green, or blue, each with a particular probability. And you could model that uh, using this kind of probabilistic choices that I've, I've, I've shown. And so what we do here is we use this probabilistic choices very much uh, like this one, map a neural predicate onto, um, um, it will, will give you the class of the image with a particular probability. And no other changes were necessary in the probabilistic language. Uh, we also didn't use any uh, extra inference engines, uh, as I will show you later. Uh, so what are the kind of things that you can do with this? Um, and again, it's very early days, but uh, some of the things we've done is like um, look at uh, how you can constrain uh, the neural network in a logical way and how you can encode background knowledge uh, in these uh, to be taken into account by these neural networks. Um, and so the first thing that we tried is can we, in a sense, um, take two images of uh, digits and can we, in a sense, classify them uh, as a part as, as how much the, their sum is, basically. Of course, this could be done with um, a standard uh, convolutional neural network. Uh, you just would have to get uh, to concatenate the two images and then you would typically get uh, 19 classes to predict and you can do that. Uh, but the thing is that um, this kind of additions would be pretty uh, much beyond the scope of the uh, convolutional neural network and it's very easy to do that with uh, deep problog in a sense. So um, here is uh, the way that we represent this. Uh, representing addition of these images is um, very easy. You get like, there will be an imp input image, there will be a second input image, this will be the sum. And so for a particular example like that, uh, digit, the orange one, that is our neural predicate, uh, digit will return um, a value and given that digit is a neural predicate, this will hold with a particular probability. So on the slide before, when I was talking about one and seven being the possible options, you would get, um, well, not for this, this image, but for the other image, uh, you would get like uh, a non-zero probability for one, you would get a, a high probability for seven, and almost zero or, or zero for all of the others, basically. And uh, so this is uh, how the neural predicate uh, is encoded. Uh, you would do the same for the second image, and then at the end of the day, you would know that the sum of the two uh, numbers that are encoded by these digits, uh, that this should be identical uh, to eight. And so that acts as a constraint on um, the learning, 
and that is automatically uh, taken into account here. Of course, we checked uh, what uh, the convolutional neural network would do, um, and uh, you can easily see that we use knowledge, yes, uh, but of course we can encode such knowledge, which is harder to encode uh, with the uh, CNNs. Uh, you can see that we converge much, much faster. I mean, the CNN converges uh, a lot uh, later and also ends up with uh, a lower accuracy. Also, the loss function is uh, not reaching the same levels as uh, for um, the um, as, as for, the, for the logical based version. Now what you see here is uh, just a little extension. It's the one to do the multi-digit additions, so where you can take arbitrary numbers, arbitrary sequences of digits, uh, and you simply add them, like 350,102 plus another equals that, and so this kind of, this kind of um, input and of course, yeah, the result, you want to see the, the real number at the end. And so what is encoded here in this program is again like uh, the typical rules of addition. It's just that you don't know how to interpret uh, which of the, which image uh, re represents uh, which number in a sense. Uh, and that for that, we use a very similar neural predicate uh, as before. And again, you see that um, the accuracy gets uh, really, really pretty high uh, after uh, a number of iterations. And this is way beyond the scope of uh, what you could do with uh, neur typical neural networks uh, today. Other things that people have been looking at is uh, program induction. I mean, I've talked about these um, uh, programming frameworks. And the dream of AI and also the dream in a lot of neural networks is can we, in a sense, automatically program computers uh, and then real programming? Um, and there's been some interesting efforts. I mean, it's a long-standing effort. Uh, people also in the logic community have looked at that. Uh, people like Alan Biermann already looked at this in, in the 80s or the 70s. Uh, so this is, is a long tradition that goes back. Uh, there is one framework that is uh, quite promising. It's uh, what is called sketching. And what you do in sketching is you write programs, but you leave certain things unspecified. Um, and I'm going to give an example later um, about sorting. Uh, say that you know how to sort things, but you don't know uh, which number is larger than which other number, in a sense. So you could leave that open. Uh, other things that people have done is, is if you don't know whether you should use less than or less than or equal, uh, you just leave that open, the choices. And then on the basis of training uh, material, training examples, you can automatically infer, you can automatically fill uh, those gaps. Um, and so um, there were programs, uh, the one, the differentiable force interpreter, this... Uh, uh, indicated there, had done some experiments with this kind of, of sketching. And uh, we've also looked at these. Um, and um, yeah, they've looked at some simple ones like sorting the one that I sketched, also adding numbers, but not MNIST numbers, but really the actual numbers. And there the task is to learn uh, what the result of addition is and also to learn the carry in a sense. Uh, and then some simple world algebra word algebra problems where they also used like uh, uh, a bidirectional L LSTM uh, underneath. Uh, to map something like that to this deep problem representation, what you would have to do is again uh, fill out a hole. I mean, this is bubble sort uh, and it's the correct implementation. It's just that uh, you don't assume here that um, you know that what to do with two numbers. You don't know uh, when you should, well, in a sense, swap the two numbers or when you should not swap the two numbers. And uh, so you can put that swap then in a neural network and you can again train uh, your neural network. And what they did for this uh, differentiable force uh, interpreter is in a sense pretty pretty similar, just a different language. This is a, a logic language. They used uh, force, which is a pretty low level, uh, hard to use and pretty hard to understand language. You might think this is also hard to understand, but that's um, another uh, issue. And then you see that um, while you get pretty good results, um, so we were training on like uh, different uh, lengths of, of, of the lists that um, 
you need to feed it with like sorted lists. And of course, the length of the list will uh, determine how fast you can learn. Uh, so you can look at lengths two, three, four, five, six, and you see that, um, well, DeepProblog uh, gets it much faster than uh, the other system and is also able uh, to do it um, uh, to keep up, uh, get better accuracies in a sense. Um, the reason is probably that the others had uh, difficulties in, in, in converging. Um, and another example, just to mention, uh, is that um, there is the coin uh, ball example uh, that I started with yesterday, uh, where you would uh, toss a coin and then uh, draw two balls. Um, we and the interesting thing about that example is that it's both logical, it tells you when you win the game, because of these logical rules, and it's also probabilistic because, well, the the orange come up with particular red, uh, green, and blue probabilities. Um, and so what we did here is very similar to with um, the MNIST uh, images. We just injected like uh, RGB values instead of like say it's red or green or blue. We just injected red, green, blue values and put uh, a neural predicate on that. And instead of getting uh, the um, head uh, or, or, or tail of the coin, uh, what uh, we did is also like show it some even or odd um, uh, MNIST images uh, to, in a sense, also uh, show that you can do this uh, from perception, from the images uh, alone. And um, the example worked uh, reasonably well. Uh, after about 250 examples and uh, five uh, epochs of training, we managed to learn uh, to classify the coins correctly, we learned to classify the colors correctly, and we also learned the bias of the coin, uh, like what's the probability that will come up heads uh, or fail. And um, so this is um, one of the, uh, well, the more recent results on this probabilistic programming, bridging, uh, trying to, to make a bridge to the neural network uh, community. And it has a couple of, of features uh, like, okay, it's based on logic programs instead of first order logic, what the others are using. Uh, you can train neural networks, you can learn the parameters, uh, you can do a bit of program induction, um, and you can also cope with some embeddings. Uh, the key thing now is to scale up, uh, because so far we've been looking at exact inference, but we're kind of changing that towards uh, to look at other uh, examples. So how does it work internally? Um, I said it was pretty easy, not to say almost trivial, to implement for us. Uh, and the reason is that um, we have this version of uh, Problog that is working with semi-rings. Uh, very much what we did with the weighted model counting yesterday uh, with the TPL algorithm. Uh, you can do very much the same kind of things at the level of programming languages. Uh, the first who did something in that direction, as far as I know, is Jason Eisner in a kind of natural language processing and also learning uh, context. And we also have a variation and extension uh, of his results in our A problem. And uh, the thing that has changed is that um, instead of having, I mean, in problog, you have like probabilities on facts. And so what you need to do is instead of having probabilities there, you just put like these elements of a semi-ring there. And then uh, under certain conditions, you will get uh, the right kind of, of answers. And uh, there's plenty of semi-rings that you can be using. Uh, I'm not gonna uh, go in any technical depths on these, uh, but I already mentioned like the difference between set and number set, and of course set, number set, and weighted mall counting um, are there. Now there's also a gradient uh, subring that uh, takes two elements. The first is the probability, the second is like the gradient, and uh, that you can use uh, to do the kind of computation. And it's this one that we use to propagate uh, the examples uh, to compute the gradient uh, for, the neural, for the neural predicates, and then you pass it on to the neural network where you can do the typical uh, kind of, of learning. Um, so that is, is the way, so it's really end-to-end -end, uh, learning. Uh, just to give you a flavor as to how this uh, algebraic problem, this problem with semi-rings work, uh, this is a, a, a most trivial logical uh, example. Uh, that will say, well, which in, in a graph, you will uh, say there is an initial node, and in this case it's A, 
and then there is like this uh, reachable predicate. You can reach any predicate. Uh, you can reach any node. Well, the first one says you can reach the initial node, and then other nodes are reachable uh, if a previous node uh, P is reachable and there is an edge from P to Q, then Q will also be uh, reachable in a sense. So it's just a recursive uh, clause in a sense. Uh, if you put these edges in, then you can really decide that, um, well, you can reach C, D, B, uh, and so on, basically. Now, the interesting thing is, this is just logic, so what you associate is the Boolean semi-ring, true, false, and the logical operations. Uh, now you can play with this, and uh, what you can do is, um, let's now add distances there. And then we don't want to compute like whether we can reach a node, but we want to compute like the minimal, uh, the distance, uh, the minimal, the shortest distance uh, between uh, two nodes in a sense, the shortest path, the length of that. And uh, all what you have to do is basically change your semi-ring into uh, your multiplication becomes addition. And uh, your uh, addition, uh, you just take the min. Uh, and that's the only thing that you need to do. Uh, of course, then assign the numbers uh, to capture the distances uh, there. You can do other things. Uh, you can put it into probabilities. You can take max and product. I mean, that's the max product that we all know that will give us the most likely state, in this case, the most likely path. And then you can take uh, plus and multiplication. And that will almost give you problog. It's just that it doesn't solve the disjoint sum problem. Um, that is not captured by this. For that, you have to do still uh, some special things, and uh, there are some things to be taken into account. I mean, very much like what you had in the weighted mod um, in the DPLL problem, uh, where you have like this this fairly general model counting problem. Um, there, you have to go through all the branches uh, because you need to to count how many there are in a sense. Uh, if you do SAT, you only need one of them. And so that means that you can optimize with regard to uh, your uh, specific uh, semi-ring uh, under considerations. And yeah, you can divide that into different categories uh, of, of uh, according to the properties of your semi-ring. And you'll need to adapt your computational uh, mechanism. Okay, and that is then uh, what we, we, we coupled, uh, the a block part, we coupled to PyTorch. And, uh, of course, my student, uh, Robin, had a lot of work with this. Uh, but um, I think the coupling conceptually was pretty clean and, and pretty neat. Uh, the last topic that I want to talk about is uh, this lifted inference. And before doing that, I also want to talk about Markov logic. Uh, Markov logic is like uh, an undirected graphical model. It's an SRL system that, um, I mean, problog, you always work with directions, right? If something is true, something else is true. And so that corresponds closely to the directed graphical models, the Bayesian networks. Uh, Markov logic corresponds closely to the undirected graphical models. And um, I'm going to briefly uh, illustrate uh, that. Um, let's... Um, simply go, go through some examples. Here you see two logical statements. Uh, they're not written in logic programs, they're not written as rules, they're really written in first order logic. And so the first one says, uh, everybody that smokes will get cancer. Um, the second one says, uh, if there are two friends, then they will either both smoke or none of them uh, will smoke, basically. Uh, that is what these uh, rules say. Now, if you would forget for a minute about the weights uh, of the, uh, the kind of parameters uh, that are listed there, uh, then this would be real logical constraints and they would be hard constraints. Uh, you can still reason about possible walls. Uh, you can reason about models of this theory. Uh, but some of them will be a model, they will satisfy the constraints, others will not. And so you get this kind of binary distinction. Now, what the idea in Markov logic is, uh, is basically that, um, well, the higher the weight, the more important the constraint is. The lower the weight, the softer the constraint is. None of the possible walls will ever be excluded unless you set the constraint to like uh, with the weight infinity, which means it's kind of a hard constraint. But otherwise, none of the, um, the possible walls will actually be uh, excluded. It's just that if constraints are not satisfied, they become less likely. 
and uh, that's the intuition uh, behind Markov logic. The way it works is that uh, here you've got, um, um, again, this, this, this idea of knowledge-based model construction, uh, if you like. Uh, I can now take, or the idea of taking this as a kind of template, and uh, say I've got two people, Anna and Bob, uh, I can then like uh, take all possible instantiations of the variables. I mean, I can substitute x by a, x by b, and then I'll get, if I do that for smokes and cancer, I'll get these two. If I do that uh, for friends, I'll get these kind of atomic constructs. And what the constraints are doing is basically they specify, uh, they, they basically specify factors uh, on these um, on, on the atoms that are being um, connected by them. So if you look at smokes, X causes cancer. Uh, well, if you substitute X by A, then you basically get a connection uh, between Anna and Anna smoking and Anna having cancer, similar for Bob. Uh, if you do that for the other ones, where of course uh, you can, for instance, look at if I uh, sub take friends and I substitute X and A, X and Y by A, then I get basically this connection, and then these other connections are the ones that you get for the other kind of instantiations. And so you can reduce Markov logic to a Markov random field, and I'll kind of define how you get into the, the factors, uh, more or less, uh, because I'm gonna take the logical perspective, which is a bit more intuitive, uh, perhaps. Um, so let's start by looking at uh, possible walls. I mean, these are the logical interpretations, the models that we've been talking about. Here are some of our atoms. They can be in or out. Um, and um, this is what you get. Now, if you have a logical theory, then each of these uh, interpretations, like here, none of these facts is true, they're all false. Uh, if they're all false, then while well, the condition part is satisfied, uh, is not satisfied, so we don't worry about the conclusion part. So then this will uh, be this first interpretation, this first uh, world will be possible. It will satisfy that kind of of uh, uh, theory, um, and you can enumerate all the models like that for fixed alphabets, uh, for fixed domains, um, and if you do that. At the end of the day, you can also look how many models there are. This is nothing else than the uh, model counting problem, uh, the number set problem uh, for first order logic. Now, what uh, Markov logic is doing is it basically um, will, if you have a world X, uh, what it will do is it will assign this kind of uh, probability to it. So Z, Z is the normalizing constant. And, uh, okay, this will be um, exponential to the sum of, um, for, for, and the sum taken over all of the rules in my, all, all of the rules in my logic. And uh, this is the weight of the rule. And this is the number of true instances that uh, are satisfied uh, in, in my logic, in a sense. So I take uh, the, the world and I look at for every, uh, for every statement, for every rule, I look at the weight of that rule and I multiply it by the number of true instances, the number of times that the, um, the rule is satisfied by this uh, interpretation. And again, it's easier to illustrate that on a little example. Um, remark that here I don't look, don't allow for substitutions x equals to n y equals to n, that is kind of a lot of clutter. So I'm gonna assume that all these substitutions uh, are different and that they're not allowed. And so we again end up with these four. Um, and so if I apply that, uh, what I will get uh, here, I can take two instances, I can assign x to Alice, and then this will be satisfied because y will be bobbed. Uh, well, uh, I, I can assign uh, x to Alice, and then the condition part doesn't hold, so the rule will be satisfied. I can assign x to Bob's, and then also the condition part will not will be satisfied. So there is two instances of that rule. The rule has weight 1.5, and 
And so the likelihood uh, of, or the probability of that possible world is one over this normalization constant times uh, this expression. And then you see that there's also less likely worlds, uh, this one. In this world, uh, I can substitute uh, Bob for X. And if I substitute Bob, then Smoke's Bob is false. So the rule is satisfied. But if I introduce Alice, so if I introduce Alice, then Smoke's Alice is true. Friends, Alice's Bob is true. But Smoke's Bob is not true. And so the rule is violated. There is kind of a violated instance. And so the number of satisfying instances of that rule in this possible world is just one. And so it's just less likely than uh, the others. Uh, here what you can do again is you can sum up all these probabilities and then you get, of course, the partition function. Uh, now the thing is um, that we also, we said probabilistic inference is model counting uh, and that was for the propositional case. We can now look and that's the holy grail of, uh, uh, that's the holy grail in the sense of this uh, statistical relational learning models, this first order probabilistic models is can we, in a sense, um, lift, uh, um, lift this kind of, of model counting uh, without needing to go through all the possible uh, interpretations uh, that we have. Um, and uh, this is the way that first order model counting problem. Um, it's a little bit different. What you do here is like in, in normal weighted model counting, uh, what we did is we would assign uh, uh, a weight to a positive literal, uh, a, a true predicate, and another weight to a negative predicate. Uh, and of course, their sums would be one. Uh, here, given that we're working with Markov models, we don't care about the sum, but we can do the same kind of thing. Smoking uh, has weight one, not smoking has weight two, friends four, not friends one. And then again, you can look at what is um, the weight of uh, this theory. And um, then um, you get a first ordered weighted model counting uh, problem, basically. Of course, if, uh, this, if your theory is not satisfied, then the weight of that world will, of course, be B1. Um, before going to the lifting, uh, one more remark. Uh, I don't have time to go into details on the learning with Markov logic, but Markov logic has been uh, pretty successfully applied in lots of different applications in reasoning about language, in reasoning about networks, uh, in bioinformatics uh, and other things. And so they also use kind of traditional uh, methods for training, uh, typically based on a kind of gradient uh, for generative models where um, you would uh, maximize a kind of, of pseudo likelihood uh, and, and other versions. So let's go to the lifting. Um, the lifting is really about avoiding this grounding uh, step wherever possible and to reason at the kind of, of, of more general level. And so let's look at how we can, um, um, how we can in a sense exploit the symmetries that are in our problems uh, to make abstraction of which specific instances we have and to, to do much faster counting. What I'll do is give you an example of uh, how this uh, lifted inference how you can do first order model counting uh, without grounding out uh, everything on just a simple example. And uh, maybe that will also trigger some thinking on your behalf. Um, and um, we, we can then, uh, of course, discuss it. Uh, if we look at statements like that, this is the kind of propositional statement. Uh, we just have one element in our domain. Uh, it's Alice, and there is one rule. Uh, question is how many models uh, are satisfied, how many possible worlds uh, do we have in here? Um, and again, well, I guess it's fairly easy to answer. Um, we have here all the possible worlds. I mean, all uh, assignments of zero and one to stress Alice and smokes Alice. And here we know that the formula holds in three out of four cases. It just doesn't hold when Alice is stressed and she doesn't smoke, then it's a violated uh, instance. And so for this, we basically have three models. 
And now we're going to gradually extend that rule to kind of more complex rules. And we gradually go from one example, from one instance in your domain to multiple. And the question is, can we still keep on that model counting? Because that's what lifting we do um, for more general formulas, like uh, this one. Can we just express this as uh, the number of models? Can we just express this as... Um, um, as um, a function of the size of the domain, basically. Um, anybody having uh, a clue how many models we now have? For all x, there's just one possible x. So, anybody? It's three, yes? So that's easy. Let's uh, make it a little bit harder. Let's, instead of having one element in our domain now, go for multiple elements. Anybody having, uh, yeah? Yeah, three to the power n. Um, because, yeah, all of the models will be, in a sense, independent. And, yeah, so that's, that's what you will get. Um, then let's look at another clause, which is slightly more complicated. Um, we now introduce this female in there. Maybe I'll let you think for... So the trick here is to uh, distinguish the two cases and then in a sense you reduce it to the previous case or to another case. Um, if female is true, sorry, if female is true, then you basically get um, the same situation as before and so the number of models will be 3 to the power n. On the other hand, if female is false, what do I get then? Well, it's always true because the condition part of the rule is false, so I don't care what the rest is. And so then I get uh, 4 to the power n. And so the number of models of this logical theory is 3 to the power n uh, for the case when female is true and 4 to the power n for the case when um, uh, female is false, basically. Um, Things get uh, a bit more complicated. Uh, we can now extend the um, the clause. I mean, we now have an argument for x, and we have two arguments here. And the thing to do here is, well, um, if I fill out, well, maybe I should let you think again. Anybody making a guess? So you can do the same trick that we did before. It's just that, I mean, if we fill out x, we basically get the same, if, if we remove x, we get the same rule as there. And we've had a case like that before. And so the number of models is like, well, this to the power n, basically, right? Because there's n possible ways of substituting x. I can change x by uh, n possibilities. Um, okay, and then here are the really harder clauses. Um, and there it's where it's getting pretty involved. Um, and the thing to do here is, again, um, is to, to kind of simplify the problem. Um, if there is n people, uh, let's first assume that we already picked k people that smoke. And so these k people are listed here. So k out of the n are smoking. And these are the people indicated in green here. Uh, we then also know that's for the x's, right? 
We also know that there is going to be k uh, possibilities uh, for the y, in a sense. And then we can look at how, what the possibilities for friends x and y are. Given that there's n people, there is n to the power 2 uh, possibilities for uh, this, this friend relationships. And, um, of course, um, all the friends relationships for k to k, um, they um, should be there. Um, then here, well, if the condition part is not satisfied, we don't care what is satisfied in our conclusion. Uh, and then the ones that we don't want to see is if x is true. So if x smokes, uh, we don't want this to go to uh, a friend, uh, y, that doesn't smoke, uh, because then the rule will be violated. Uh, uh, we get a true condition, x smokes, x is friend of y, but y doesn't smoke. And these are the guys we don't want, basically. All the other options uh, are, in a sense, fine. Also, the option that if somebody doesn't smoke, um, would be friend with somebody that smokes. And so you see that uh, the possible number of models uh, for fixed k here um, that would satisfy this rule is, um, well, there is n to the power 2 possible uh, friends, ships, relationships, out of these, uh, this number, uh, which is like this k times n minus k, um, is, no, that's, that's not, it's this one, it's this combination that we don't want, k times n minus k. Um, and so we can take all subsets thereof. The only thing that we don't shouldn't take is we should not take any of these combinations. And so the number of, of possible models there is this. Uh, but initially, so is that kind of intuitively clear? Um, the kind of simplifying assumption that we made initially is that um, we fixed k. But of course, k could be anything. It could be any number between 0 and n. And so, well, you have to multiply it by n choose k. And then, um, you, that, that's for, well, sorry. Um, you, you, you have to uh, choose k members from the n. So uh, we chose these five people. Uh, we could also have chosen others. And these are the number of possibilities for getting these. And then, of course, you can still vary k. So that would be the total number of uh, models that you have. And you see that with these, even with these very simple uh, logical formulas and with just one logical formula, I mean, counting this stuff becomes pretty, pretty much uh, involved. Uh, but again, this is what is essential in the sense to solve uh, the inference problem. Um, it's also what people do in Markov logic. You can turn this Markov logic very easily into a model counting problem. All what you have to do is for each of the rules that is uh, in the Markov logic formula, uh, you would have to introduce a hard logical formula which says, okay, the formula is true. Uh, you would include the variables there. Um, uh, the formula is true uh, if and only if this f is true. And then you put the weights uh, on the f. f is gonna get the 3.14 uh, uh, in a sense, um, and so f is going to get the 3.14, not f is going to get 1, and all of the others are going to get f, uh, are going to get a 1. And then you can show that you have reduced Markov logic to a kind of first order weighted model counting problem. Uh, now, people have been working on lifted inference techniques. One of the things uh, my former student, uh, he has done, is like turn this into you know, the circuits, like the BDDs, they are all propositional. Uh, this kind of knowledge compilation techniques that you can try to extend to cope also with this first order logics, but that is getting pretty involved and it also uh, is not always possible uh, to use this. There are like of positive and negative results um, in, in, in this area of, of lifted inference. There's formulas that you can map onto a circuit on which you can do polynomial inference. Uh, there is also negative results uh, that exist there. And so things get uh, pretty uh, involved. So let me uh, stop the part on lifted inference uh, and let me try to conclude. 
um, by remind, reminding you that we've been trying to do um, combinations of reasoning and learning. Uh, we've been looking at the two main frameworks for reasoning, which is probabilistic reasoning that is all over the place. Uh, there's also logical reasoning that can be quite useful and quite uh, uh, easy to express knowledge with. And then we've had flavors of these two types of frameworks. One is the SRL frameworks, which in a sense upgrade graphical models with elements of first order logic. And then there is the probabilistic programming languages, which uh, do the same with uh, pro probabilistic, uh, with, with programming language uh, constructs. And um, so that's also like a pretty active area of research. The STAR AI, this SRL community, there's annual workshops uh, that attract like 50 to 100 people. Uh, there's major, uh, at the major AI events, at the UAI uh, events, uh, and so on, basically. Uh, in case you want to read on on this, I'd recommend for pure probabilistic uh, programming, uh, there is a pretty nice readable uh, account of the church language, also with a kind of uh, in interface where you can type in programs and you can see what you can get back. Uh, I think they now have their second version already. It's propmods.org. It's by the former MIT team. Uh, there is Problog, which is, is very similar. Uh, there is Alchemy, uh, where you can look at um, the stuff on, on Markov logic. And there is also the book that gives uh, a, a pretty uh, gentle introduction uh, to, to the field, basically. Okay, I'm, I'm going to leave it here. Uh, I don't know whether there's questions.